I apologise, it's very, it's very red. For some reason, when I was putting this thing together, I decided, I don't know why, I wouldn't decide to go red. Anyway, um, so uh, when we had this session announced on sustainability, I was really uh, keen uh, to speak at it, not as someone who's actually doing the work as a chief executive, but as someone, uh, it's interesting, Kate's talked quite a bit about chief executives and, and their role in organisations, but as someone who uh, came to an organisation with a, a strong and deep commitment to public engagement, and really, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on that, the kind of work we're doing, and, and then maybe just, if I have time, touch on some of the implications of this for the development-led market. But I think, actually, Sarah and Kate have said a lot of the things that I was going to say, so that may be very brief. So I'd say the structure will be a very brief introduction to York Archaeological Trust, because sometimes we always have a belief that everybody knows everything about us, which is plainly wrong. Um, and then a little discussion about the genesis of our Institute for... Uh, heritage and Sustainable Human Development, a run through some case studies very quickly, as Mark said, and focusing on one in particular, and then moving on to my conclusion. So without further ado, just sort of setting the scene. Um, I think it's worth um, reminding ourselves, it's very interesting, we talked about organisational change uh, earlier on uh, and the challenges of that. One of the interesting issues for me, I became the Chief Executive in the York Archaeological Trust in uh, 2013, nearly 10 years ago. Um, and when you join an organisation, uh, there's always the question of a change programme, the change programme. But what's interesting about organisations, and I was talking to Mike about this uh, in the audience, and Mike Dawson, we were just talking about this. There is, I think, organisations have a, a kind of a DNA that gets built into them quite often. And that's particularly the case with the York Archaeological Trust. And I'm sort of showing a slide here of the Coppergate excavations in the 1970s. Um, and there's... Once it's built into the DNA of an organisation, it's, it's, it can be very challenging to change it. And actually what's more interesting is to look at that DNA and to see how to adapt to make it uh, more valuable in the current environment. Um, so when I think about the trust DNA, I'll just talk a little bit about that because I think it's fundamental to what we're talking about today. Um, I guess the, the, the origin story that everybody tells themselves in the York Archaeological Trust is that is, is a lot of it revolves around the Coppergate excavations in the 1970s and then the development of the Jorvik Viking Centre. Uh, and this places us, this is this degree of self-delusion, but this places us in a position where we think that um, what's fundamental to our organisation is this ability to go from beginning uh, ground investigation all the way through to engagement with the public. Uh, the development of attractions and exhibitions and all these kinds of things. And so that's a fundamental way about how we look at ourselves and how we deliver value. Um, so I think it's, it's probably also worth saying that when development-led archaeology came along, I think for those of us who've been in the sector for a long time, it was recognised that the York Archaeological Trust didn't respond to it. Uh, it was, well, uh, probably the quickest way is to say it was brought kind of kicking and screaming into the world of development-led archaeology. Didn't particularly want to go there. Uh, it had a very different model of how it saw archaeological practice, which was very much based in a region, uh, was very much based in its community, uh, and about doing sustained work over a long period. So these are just some of the things that are floating around in the background of the trust. Um, I picked out three words, which, um, again, actually, I think, I think these are the three words that the founding director, Peter Adamant, used for the trust. But he said it was always about doing research, so it was about finding out about the past, it was always about, uh, maybe I should put communication second, it was always about then communicating that to the biggest audience. He had a real uh, belief that um, we only practice archaeology because we gain public support. So we need to demonstrate that public benefit. So we saw it as a kind of three-legged component of doing good quality research, actually understanding something about the past, communicating that, and genuinely delivering public benefit to a community. Um, and as I say, this is what led the trust on then to develop, uh, ultimately develop the Jorvik Viking Centre off the back of these excavations. Oh, hang on. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Hang on. Put my glasses on. Mm -hmm. ah. What have I done? Ah. So, Jorvik Viking Centre, so there we go. Just give it a quick plug. This is my plug in the sustainability sector. We always say, I think this is one of the best examples of development-led archaeology resulting in sustainability. 20 million visitors, 680 million pounds into the local economy, 
in modern day terms. Um, still going 38 years uh, strong. Um, so that's a fundamental part of how we see engagement. It allows us, the reality is the Yorvik Viking Centre produces about 60% of our revenue. Uh, it allows us to do a lot of other things. We've also developed things like DIG, which is 50,000 school children a year. So again, that's something like 1.6 million school children have been through DIG since we opened the doors. These are significant public benefits delivered in a sustainable way year in, year out. Um, and then we do things like the Yorvik Viking Festival. So there's this part of the trust that it's interesting, again, when we were talking about um, sustainability and public benefit, again, someone said, you know, it's not all in the development-led sector. A lot of what we are doing is not in the development-led sector. It's actually, uh, it's a lie to it, but it's, uh, it, our drivers are somewhat different. So that's the background. In terms of setting the scene, uh, for, for understanding um, why we established Inherit. I would love to say that um, with this sort of uh, ethos of public benefit, that, that uh, within the trust we came up with the idea of, of establishing Inherit, but actually it was the founding members of Inherit who came to us and said, we've got this idea for an institute. Oh, and by the way, we've got a, a very significant donation that will come along with it, um, and this will allow us to establish, we want to establish this institute which focuses on the heritage and sustainable human development. So that's its, that's its kind of Sunday name. We call it Inherit for short, because that seems, that's quite a good name, I think, Inherit. Um, so anyway, so 2017, we established this institute, had three directors initially. Um, it's based in Glasgow because that's where the people were based. So it's remote from our location. Um, and it's it very much as you can tell, the name d does what it says on the tin. So I think what's interesting to me, and I, the reason I put my little slide of my, I think a lot of what we do, it was really, so, oh, I should say, let's just name check the people, because actually I'm saying it's their work, it's not mine. So we think about the directors of Inherit. Originally there was uh, Alan Leslie, who left in, in 2019. Um, the two directors that are left now are Aphrodite Soratu and uh, Chris Dalgleish. And it was Chris, actually, who, who I, just, I will have to read this, who, who gave me a quote early on um, from an American ecologist. And it kind of references in a lot of things that kind of Sarah mentioned already, a guy called Aldo Leopold. And he said, people form a land community along with soils, plants, and animals. Land as a community, land, um, as a community is a basic concept of ecology. Uh, everything's interdependent, and therefore it's prompted to to, uh, to cooperate. And I think that if I look at a lot of the projects that we're doing, it has that kind of component of understanding communities in a landscape. And, and I just put my little, hopefully you can see what I can see when I look at the, the rocky face on the, on, the, on the extreme left. My extreme left, your extreme right. I just thought it was a nice example of community as land people in the landscape and the landscape being people as well. Um, and so a lot of our work is, so we have done a huge range of projects within Inherit, and it's kind of tried to focus on three themes which are listed here, and I'll try not to, to read my own slides. Uh, a lot of these things, it's interesting, Kate, where you were saying about where, where, where we can have the biggest impact. About, uh, quite a bit of our work does relate to, to clim the climate crisis, but quite a lot of it is actually about, uh, some of it's obviously about gender equality, peace and justice, um, uh, health and well-being, uh, so, so some of our, a lot of our work is, is actually uh, clean water and sanitation. It's actually working in quite a lot of these sustainable development goals, which is why I'm sorry, Jill, I didn't answer when, when you asked the question, because I thought, I'm going to say these things. So we're working across quite a lot of these sustainable development goals, and it, and it maps into the things that we do. So just quickly, um, a few of the projects that we've done. That's what I've got left, is it, Mark? Right, my goodness. So, quickly. So, uh, we've done a lot of work in Scotland, uh, and again, that reflects the research interests of Chris Dalgleish. Um, and uh, so we've got the Carlaway uh, estate up here on the, I can't do it, your, your top left. Um, and we've done a lot of work with uh, Community Land Scotland, um, looking at community land, uh, looking at sustainability of community land, uh, and the way in which uh, community, uh, community estates are managed in a more sustainable way. 
Uh, so we've done a huge range of projects there. Uh, the one in the top right is in Kurdistan, uh, is working, that's the Slimani um, Kids Museum in Suleymaniye. Again, working with the University of Glasgow, who are the lead partner. I should also say in a lot of these projects, we're always working in partnership. It's another fundamental aspect of this, this space. Uh, but again, providing a museum for children, who are the biggest visitors to the museums in Kurdistan, but obviously it's been a, a, co a country that's been very much divided by conflict uh, for a very long time with very low investment in museums. So trying to sort of change the landscape. Uh, we've been doing, we do a lot of work with the British Council, major funding body for our work. Uh, so in the bottom left, China, we've been doing, uh, looking at uh, how we develop inclusive growth or using cultural heritage to deliver inclusive growth. Uh, so doing policy work in China. In terms of rivers, we did uh, early days, we did quite a bit of work on the Ayosh River, the, the last free flowing rivers in Europe, and trying to work with communities. These, these rivers are all uh, underneath uh, lots of proposals for construction of dams, which will basically take the last free flowing rivers of Europe out, apart from in Russia. Um, and uh, so we were working with communities about how we may be able to negotiate a better settlement, something that's more sustainable. Um, so that's just a quick canter through those things. And I just thought I'd just talk quickly, we'll be quick, about um, work we've been doing with um, the uh, Lebanese Bedouin, began with the Lebanese Bedouin, the Cultural Corridors of Peace. And uh, again, this is a project funded by the British Council and DCMS. Um, it's been started, it started in 2018. We've just finished our latest phase of field work in Lebanon, which as you can imagine has been quite challenging. Um, and this, again, was trying to work with a community that is, I mean, the Bedouin people of the Middle East, uh, but start, we started in Lebanon, but, and when you look at the Lebanese Bedouin, they're extremely marginalized people, uh, not even officially recognized by the government in quite a lot of cases. A lot of them don't have Lebanese citizenship for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, so they're a very marginalized community. Um, their traditional roots of uh, transhumance have been completely uh, broken by the erection of hard borders by the dear old colonial estates after the World War I. So, you know, they traditionally the Lebanese Bedouin have moved through to Syria and into the Levant. All of that's been taken away from them. Um, so, working with this community to conserve their cultural heritage and to allow them to um, explore their cultural heritage and use it as a resource. The interesting thing with the Bedouin, of course, is that in, in, in essence, their whole life was a way of sustainability in an extremely hostile environment, quite often a very hostile environment, not always. Um, so it's a real source of resilience for them. Um, but to, uh, and so working with them, um, again, people have talked about, they think, Sarah, you may have been said this from the floor yesterday, I don't know if it was you, Sarah, actually, but, but someone was saying, you know, you've got to do this from the ground up. So again, to stress that a lot of this work, it's not us going out top down and saying, this is your cultural heritage. It's talking to these people about what is their cultural heritage and them uh, being very much in the middle of defining what the cultural heritage is. I think a lot of the paper we're going to get on, I think it will cover similar ground, Jackie. Um, so it's deep, long conversations. It's creating an open archive for them. And, it's, uh, and now we're starting to talk about creating a cultural heritage centre for them. Uh, but we've looked at all kinds of things like women's, uh, the role of women in Bedouin communities, uh, food, the loss of the nomadic way of life. Uh, we, did an, we put an exhibition in London. Um, and we also did a... Uh, there was a uh, we extended the project, talking to the Bedouin of Jordan and Palestine, and there was a cultural gathering in Wissi's Wadi Rum in uh, Jordan, so it's a nice slide, um, where we brought the Bedouin communities together, and it was really interesting to have these people with diverse traditions, but actually uh, a lot of commonality. But they, again, they've been very separated from each other. And if you want to know about the challenges of a project, just having people from Palestine and Lebanon in Jordan at a time when there was all kinds of crises going on both in the West Bank and in Lebanon and couldn't even get people back to their home countries. It just gives a whole different scale of definition of what it is to work for people uh, who are really marginalised. You can find out a lot more about this project on cultural, uh, on the website, it's a big website resource, there's an open archives, all kinds of things. So for me, I just wanted to stress, I guess, so why are we doing this? We're a bit idealistic, I guess, of saying we were dra dragged kicking and screaming into the world of development-led archaeology. Um, uh, I certainly don't want to uh, um, 
be completely negative about it, as, as has been said, and as Sarah just said, there's huge industries developed from it, but we could do it better. And in essence, I think in the Trust, we're, we're still a little bit idealistic, uh, and I would like to see us do development-led archaeology better. Uh, it was great to get Desi talking about archaeology and prescription, which is one of our other initiatives. We were trying to look and push the boundaries about how can we genuinely deliver public benefit. Um, because I think, as people have said, um, to me, uh, the marketplace is, is when you put archaeology in a marketplace, there is some level of distortion that's taking place. Uh, and we need to be honest about that. I fully accept what you were saying, Kate, about how we need to, to talk at that top table, but there is a level of distortion taking place, and it's useful to at least acknowledge that and to think that through in its implications. I guess what I'm saying at the moment is I'm still thinking it through, uh, but what we're trying, what I think we are going to be trying to do is to push some of this benefit more into our development-led work because we think it's really important. So the other things to stress, you're always working in diverse partnerships, essentially, definitely with the communities that you're working with, not two or four, you know, not, not controlling, but you're working with people. Uh, and then we'll work, and in a lot of these projects, we've been working with a, a huge uh, range of other organizations, um, lots of other people involved. But to me, one of the challenging bits is, is for all the stuff we've done on sustainability, is actually f sustaining the resource. It's very difficult because it's all grant funded work and it's very hard to do, uh, which is why ultimately we've come up with Inherit as a very, very small body. Uh, we tried other initiatives, uh, which to be honest failed because the cost was so high for us as an organization. So it requires a lot of scale, it requires some scale to even carry this uh, and you've got to be committed to it. Um, I think you've got to really want to do it. Uh, there are lots of internal benefits that come through. It's interesting with evaluation. I mean, the guys who've been working in Inherit are now, we're now tasking them to start an evaluation exercise on everything that we do in the Trust, from excavation right the way through to attractions and events, because we think there's just a huge amount of expertise they've developed, which will be useful to us. Um, the set of methodological advances in terms of, again, community engagement. We're starting to now use that on projects in, in North Yorkshire, for example, in North Allerton, working for the County Council there. Um, and there's a lot of skill sharing and development that goes on in the organisation. I think, as people have said, there's a big skills deficit. There's a huge skills deficit, I think, as archaeologists. And I would say as me coming into uh, being a chief exec of the Archaeological Trust, just even looking at the whole attraction side of the organisation and how they engage with the public, we've got a huge amount to learn just from that sector alone. It's amazing how that wall is there between museums and attractions, say, and archaeologists. They're very, very different people. My organization has got two very, very different cultures running. Uh, and if we don't not acknowledge that slightly, mm. puts you in a different place. It's hugely political, goes without saying, but it is hugely political working in this environment. I don't think that's a problem. The past is a political place. Uh, but, but it's a very different world than the kind of PR control of our uh, clients, should we say, in the development-led sector. It's very, very different. Um, and so I won't say anything else about that element because I'm sure I've run out of time uh, and I shall stop there. Thank you very much.